Hello, my name is Katie and I'm here today with museum scientist Christian and we're going to be talking all things Kalugos. If you haven't seen our previous video about Kalugos, then you can find it in the description. So thanks so much for joining us today. Um, thanks for having me. So these are absolutely fascinating mm -hmm. animals and I'm really interested as well in these specimens that you've brought with you today. Yep. Um, so I've heard they are nicknamed flying lemurs, but they're not lemurs and they mm -hmm. technically can't fly. So what are they? Yeah, so Kalugos, theoretically known as flying lemurs, they uh, belong to their own group of mammals called Demopterans or Kalugos. Currently, there are two species validly known. There is the Philippine Kalugo, which is found in the Philippines on the Southern Islands specifically, as well as the Sundiatic Kalugo. And the Sundiatic Kalugo is found in a region called the Sunda Shelf. So that includes a large amount of um, peninsula as well as insular Southeast Asia. And these guys are found in Southern Indochina all the way down to Java, so a pretty big distance. What they actually are is they are a gliding mammal, as far as you could say. Um, they spend their entire lives in the trees. Um, they can glide very far distances with their gliding membranes or their patagiums, which you can see over here. And um, I think they're just very neat animals. Yeah, I mean, they're amazing to look at. They're so unique. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of evolution, how did they evolve to be like this? And do we know why they evolved to be like this as well? So, these guys are actually a sister group to primates. When they were first described, uh, they were described as lemur volans by Linnaeus. And he described them as lemur volans, so everyone kind of thought that these things were lemurs. But more recent um, genetic evidence has shown us that these guys actually had a common ancestor with our primate ancestors. And when they were living in the trees at some point, there was an offshoot and instead of evolving you know, the long fingers and um, dexterity and the quadrupedal lifestyle and the boreal lifestyle that primates had, these guys evolved uh, a much more unique way in terms of gliding. And actually, you do find quite a lot of um, animals in, within Southeast Asia that have independently evolved this gliding uh, mechanism. So you have um, tree frogs, you have um, lizards, you have snakes, and you have even squirrels that glide. Um, and you find these quite commonly in the rainforests um, across Southeast Asia. Right. So you mentioned flying squirrel there. Yep. What would be the difference then between hmm. these and something like a flying squirrel? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is a specimen of a Sunda Kalugo um, from our collection in the museum here, collected or registered in 1843. And what is the most distinctive part of this animal is its patagium, which you can see very distinctively already. And this gliding membrane stretches from the back of his neck over here up to the tips of its fingers and in between those fingers all the way down to his lower extremities on its tail. Now, compared to things like, you know, flying squirrels, flying squirrels typically have their patagiums extending probably right to the border of um, their hands. With the Klugos, it stretches right in between those finger pads, which you can see right there. And this allows them, or is supposedly allows them, a much greater degree of control when they're actually gliding in the air. And even more so, you can see it with their tail over here, like, that patagium goes all the way through. When you see them tucked up against the sides of trees, when they're not gliding, um, this folds entirely in and they become a nice, well, a nice compact little beastie. Aww. <laughs> and um, they, y you mentioned kind of like living in the trees. Mm -hmm. What sort of lifestyle do, hmm. they, do they lead? So these guys live a very nocturnal lifestyle, firstly. Okay. And you can tell that by their big eyes, which you can't see in the specimens, obviously. But within their skulls over here, you can see that they have these orbits that hold very uh, large eyes that allow them to have great nighttime vision. 
They hang out in trees their entire life. If you look at their claws, they have these little tiger claws, wow. and this allows them to grip on very strong to the sides of trees. And so during the day, typically you would find these guys, sometimes they'd be awake foraging, but most of the time they'd be asleep. Okay. And uh, generally, if you're trying to look for a Kalugo, the place that I've seen them the most is right underneath the crooks of trees. So okay. if that was a tree branch, mm -hmm. they would be kind of in the armpit of the tree, nestled up into a little ball, and it almost looks like a gall of a tree. Oh. And so it's an amazing camouflage, and you can yeah. see that these guys have this varied sort mm. of patterning across them. The, the Sunda Kalugo, Galeopterus variegatus, mm -hmm. is variegatus means variegated because they come in all sorts of browns and oranges to the paler colors that you see over here. And when they are active in the evenings, you find them all over the place. They can be interacting with each other, climbing up trees, uh, gliding around the forest, but typically just looking for things to eat, mm -hmm. just like most of other animals yeah. are trying to do. Yeah. Um, what they do eat is um, fruits, flowers, leaves, and there are aspects of the Kalugo that we just don't understand because they're right. not very well understood. So they have been reported to eat sap um, as well as seen to be licking trees, but there isn't a fine degree of certainty of exactly okay. what they're consuming within this environment mm. sometimes. Okay, so speaking of eating, I mm -hmm. can see here, is this the jaws and teeth yes. of a Kalugo? Their teeth are really small and yep. really, really fascinating. They are very interesting. So Kalugos are one of the mammals in the world that have evolved something independently known as comb teeth. And if you look at these teeth right over here, you can see that they have individual little combs um, wow. within them. So the lower two incisors and the two teeth past that, it's theorized that these are used typically for grooming as well as um, scraping things off trees or uh, for accessing food. But what they use it most for is grooming and it's to maintain this patagium and this flight membrane. So if you were ever able to touch a Kalugo, which I don't think most people should or be able to do, but if you're in this collection, it's another thing. Um, they have extremely soft fur. This is a pretty old specimen, and so it wouldn't have the most beautiful fur patterns, but this fur on the underside, as well as on the skin, on the patagium, is actually extremely soft. Yeah. And it is very prone to things within a humid tropical rainforest, things like um, mold or decay or, um, pests such as other in, well, insects or other parasites. And so it's thought that these comb teeth are able to help uh, at the Kugel to groom itself. Wow. It is really, really soft, isn't it? Yeah. So um, am I right in thinking that not many people are studying Kalugos mm -hmm. and they're not massively well known about? Um, so in terms of kind of modern day research, mm -hmm. Um, what do we what, what what are we doing to kind of uh, study Kalugos? Right. So today, within current research, the Kalugo is still a bit of an understudied understudied beast, um, unfortunately, and because of a myriad of reasons, just like how they're very cryptic and nocturnal, and it's hard to find them, and generally, comparative to a lot of the other big mammals going around, like tigers or elephants or lions people aren't generally as interested about the weird and wonderful small things that you don't really typically see in your natural history documentaries. But um, there is a growing interest in looking at Kalugo and Kalugo populations that exist. Like I said, the Sunda Kalugo, um, these two over here, they live all across Southeast Asia. And if you're thinking about, you know, um, Eastern Vietnam and Southern Cambodia, all the way down to Java, that's a huge amount of distance. Um, several lines of evidence have shown that the Kalugos on that Sunday attic shelf on the islands of Borneo and Sumatra and Peninsula, Malaysia and Thailand, as well as Indochina, are theoretically or could be separate populations. And for an animal that is entirely dependent on forested systems, that isn't able to cross um, big sort of obstacles like mountains or rivers, it's more than highly likely that these populations that exist across Southeast Asia are distinct genetic lineages that, that 
um, currently exists. Uh, the problem is that Southeast Asia is, as a place is, has and is experiencing a huge amount of habitat change, modification, and development in the area. And this has caused quite a number of degrees of biodiversity loss. And for things like colugos that are highly dependent on the ecosystems that they live in, this has resulted in ex well, smaller level um, extirpation events. So uh, events in which they no longer exist in forests that they used to. While this is theoretically seen as a range reduction, uh, when you think of Sunday Attic colugos as one species, if you consider that uh, different populations of different islands might actually be unique evolutionary lineages on their own, we could actually be witnessing extinction not by and not recognizing it. Mm -hmm. So that is a pretty important part. And Kalugos are have been in Southeast Asia as as humans have been. I think my favorite story along the lines of them is that if you're walking through a Southeast Asian rainforest at night and a Kalugo flies overhead and you don't have a torchlight on, it is nothing more than a black shadow that crosses across uh, the light in the sky. Wow. And I've talked to quite a few friends as well as local people about this. And certain, there are certain theories around the Kalugo being the basis of a lot of Southeast Asian ghost stories. Mm. Um, and so something that is connected to both the nature, the people, and the culture of a region should, is something that mm. should be retained and yeah. conserved and protected. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. But thank you so much for, for coming and sharing your knowledge about them. Thank you for having me. It was great. If you've enjoyed learning about Kalugos, then let us know your favourite facts in the comments down below. In the meantime, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more content from the Natural History Museum.